as I was driving to work this week, I had passed by Meridian and 47th Street, and there's a big old field there. And in that field, there were probably hundreds of geese just sitting there, and it was uh, in awe of all these geese. And uh, as they all took off, it was just an amazing sight. And I started thinking about the geese and the illustration that they fly in the V formation and, and uh, how they conserve their energy and how they can fly further when they're together. And I started thinking about the sermon that I was getting ready to preach today and I was making on teamwork and how that, that illustration goes hand in hand with the church and how what we have to do as a church and how we can get together and do greater things as a team or we try to do things by ourselves and then we fail because we can't do near as much as an individual than we can as a team. Now, at the start of this, I want to say I understand that when we come into church, the church is, has a lot of different priorities and a lot of different purposes. And I understand you as an individual, when you come into church, you have different needs to be met. It would be awesome if we had a full packed house and everybody said in the church was awe-inspiring and wanting to worship God and, and wanted to see souls saved and see people baptized and packed out and everybody working together. And that would be a wonderful sight. But in all actuality, the church is not full of a bunch of people that are on fire for God. In all actuality, the church has a lot of different individuals in it and some of those individuals are very hurt and struggling. Sometimes they come into church and they need answers to their questions. And although the church is there for a purpose, but when everybody does its share, what God can do within the body of Christ can be amazing. But just because we are full doesn't mean we are successful. Just because we have a packed house doesn't mean that we're doing what God wants us to do. The ultimate goal of the church is for the body of Christ to grow spiritually. The ultimate goal of us individually is for us to take another step in our faith to wherever we are to motivate to that next step. And God has called the church, the local entity of the church, in order to engage people's lives, to grow them to a place where they are on a growth pattern spiritually. You know, just because, well, uh, Javier used this illustration. I've got this new little gadget I'm playing with. It's called the, the Fitbit. Anybody heard of the Fitbit? Yeah, I needed it a few years ago, but I've gained quite a few pounds over the last couple of years. And um, I, I got on the scale last week, and I, you know, I, I decided to go buy a Fitbit. Let me just put it that way. But this Fitbit tells me how many steps I've taken. It tells me how many calories I've burned. And it tells me how active I am on a daily basis. And it starts over every night at midnight. So uh, yesterday I went to the Y because I was all, you know, fired up. So I took my keys out of my pocket and my Fitbit was with my keys and I put it in the cup holder. So I was exercising on this bike for 20, 30 minutes and I was sweating. And I said, I wonder how many steps I've taken. Looked at my Fitbit and it was in the cup holder. I thought, I worked out for 30 minutes and I got nothing out of it. But then I realized it wasn't for the Fitbit. I was the one that was supposed to get something out of it. And sometimes we can do so much and stay so active and not get anything out of it. But when we are utilizing what God has given to us as a ministry or as a tool to reach people, we as a church can become active and be successful in our activity. So the scripture I want to share with you today is Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, and we're going to talk about the body of Christ. Now, whether you are in the body of Christ or whether you're searching and you have problems going on in your life, the church has a purpose, and that purpose is to point people to Christ. And if the church is doing what it's supposed to do, we will be successful. But if the church ends up doing things for themselves and not for the glory of Christ, we may grow numerically, but we're not going to grow spiritually. And if we do not grow spiritually, God is not going to honor us. When, when Pastor Al tells us that there's three or four or five or six hundred people that come through the doors of this church every year, I have to ask the question, why would they come here? They have to go by every other church, and, and they have a decision that they can go to a church. But some reason... They end up at this church, and they're sitting in these seats. And we have a purpose 
of what we need to do in their life. And it's not necessarily just to preach to them. It's not necessarily just to have the music. It is God put them in this place for a particular purpose. And in doing that, I want to share today what our job as the church is in ministering to them that walk in our door. They came to this church because God inspired them to come to this church. He may have manipulated that by using individuals to bring them in, but when they are here and they are hurting and they are struggling and they have questions, what we have to do is we have to give to them the hope of the world that can change their life. And this scripture tells us how we need to do it. It says this in verse 15. But speaking the truth, what was that word? In love. You ever been to a church or been around people that they don't speak the truth and they definitely don't speak the truth in love? We've been to churches where there's no love there. When people are struggling, when they're hurting and they're destitute, we have to give them the hope of Jesus Christ and we have to give it to them in love. May grow up in all things into him who is the head and that is Jesus Christ. The purpose of the church is to speak to people in love, to love them, to help them and to encourage them. And we have to do that because the only hope that we have is who's in charge of the church is Jesus Christ. From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. You know, there's a phrase that teamwork makes the dream work. When we have teamwork, when the body of Christ is working together, we have an aspiration and a dream and some goals. But we have a problem when we're talking about the dream work for the church. Because it's not about filling the church. It's about ministering to the individuals. And although we may have aspirations to fill the church, if we do not have the aspirations to change people's lives, we are not doing what God wants us to do. But if we get into their lives and we change lives, then the dream that God has given to us is fulfilled in individual lives. So when God has brought individuals into the church and we have the whole body of the church looking at what we can do in order to minister grace and love to the individuals that are hurting, what we can do is not the job of the preacher to minister to every individual, it's the job of the body to minister to the individuals. And if the body or the church looks up and says, what can I do if the Bible says from the whole body joined and knit together but what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share. The body of Christ must be activated. It must not be just satisfied. It has to be something that just motivates them to do great things for the cause of Christ. When we're looking at what uh, Christ has done for us, we, we, we look at the ministries of the church and we're going to talk about teamwork. And if, if, if you're involved in one of these ministries, I will tell you that our church could not be successful without every one of these ministries going hand in hand. It, let, me, let me just list them. The Bible study leaders, ushers, our deacons, our discipleship ministry, door greeters, or Connection Central, our upward soccer program, children's choir, kids worship, preschool, our Awana's ministry, Ignite, uh, kids summer camp, kids youth camp, Young marrieds, our community groups, our youth workers, our youth camps, our band, our drama, our worship team, our media team, sound, lighting, video, camera, website, social media, women's ministry, meal ministry, churchwide, or rejoicers, our wedding coordinators, our cafe workers, our nursery workers, our child care team, our security team, our pantry ministry leaders, and our mom-to-mom -mom ministries. Those are just some things that as we were going to staff meeting, we started listing different ministries. And we started thinking about the ministries that what we must get involved with in order to be successful. There's lots of things that we need help with. And if the body of Christ is going to grow, it's not going to grow with the 30, 40, or 50 individuals that continue to do everything. If we're going to dream big dreams and do great things for God and to be the church God wants us to be, we must work together as a total team that is found in Ephesians chapter 4. So let me give you an acrostic to that. I started with teamwork. The first is trust. The first is trust. Trust the church. 
And now trusting the church is not trusting the pastor. Trusting the church is trusting the church, the body of Christ. And the only way that we're going to trust the church is if the church ministers. When, when you minister, when somebody comes into the house of God and they need something and you are inspired by God and motivated by the Holy Spirit to go in and minister to that individual and you walk up to them and you encourage them and they may have a trouble, they may go in through all kinds of stuff within their life and you are the person, you are the minister, you are the church that comes into their life. When they walk out of these doors and they say, it was good to be in the house of the Lord, it was because the church... You as an individual walked up and you ministered to them in a way that they needed. You didn't know what they needed. The Holy Spirit directed them and directed you to come together for that divine encounter that God allowed you to minister. But when we do not or when we are not trustworthy to God's leadership, what we do is we go to church. We enjoy church. But God doesn't want us to come to church just to enjoy it. He wants us to come to church to engage it, to be trustworthy in every area of our ministry. Trustworthiness. It is one of the most hard things that we could ever do is to trust. But when you lose that trust, you lose everything. But when you have trust, when you have confidence, when you know that the body of Christ is going to do what it needs to do, I could not tell you how many times I've talked to people, whether it's in the church or whether it's in counseling, that they, you've heard this illustration, they just think that the the ceiling's going to cave in if they walk in the church. I say, you know what? I'm going to be honest with you. Glenville is full of crazies. Give me an amen. Amen. Okay, we're like Wichita shockers. We are crazy. Okay, I've been going to Wichita. My boy goes there, so he's been getting me free tickets to Wichita State. So I'm standing in the student section, literally standing in the student section for two and a half hours watching the game. By the end of the game, my legs are tired. I'm the old man. I mean, I'm the white-haired old man in there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> even on, on, the, on the fan cam, they go up there to show the student section. All these kids are sitting there. Here's the old man with white hair. But you know what? I'm standing with them. I'm not sitting down. I'm standing. I'm having fun. And they're crazy. They're loud. It's exciting. It's fun. You know what? How much more fun would it be to change somebody's life? We're sitting up there with the crazies, sitting up there with all the fans, and they are fanatical. And we come to church, what we have to do is we have to understand that people are crazy. Glenville is full of people that are hurting. And what we have is we have a unique ability to accept, to allow people that are not quite normal. Wrong. Wrong. You're sitting on the front row, okay, that are not quite normal to come into the church to do one thing, to anoint them with love, Jesus. Wow. That is something the world can't do. That is something Wichita State shockers can't do. We can be enjoying, we can be crazy, we can come up and we can shout, and we can have a great time for two and a half hours, but it's not life-changing. But when we come into a church and we have people that are hurting and struggling, we can do something greater than anybody else could do. We can give to them the life-changing message of Jesus Christ in a unique way that only you can deliver to them because God has gifted you or has allowed you to go through junk in your life so you can administer God's grace in their life. There's nothing that you have gone through. There's no issue that you could ever do that God has not ordained and has anointed and has blessed so you to pour your life back into somebody else. But so often, sometimes in many churches, they put that facade on or they put that fake life on. I haven't got a problem. I didn't go through anything. I'm a perfect individual. I'll come to church and I'll worship and I'll act like everything's wonderful, but people are sitting beside you that are struggling and dying And we won't minister to them because we're afraid to take off the mask. And if we're afraid to take off the mask, we can't be trusted. The one thing that God has asked us to do is to teach them in love, giving to them Jesus Christ. And then he says, the entire body has been gifted by God to do what he has called us to do. It is not the pastor, it is the church. 
And if the church, the body of Christ, will do that one thing, we can be trustworthy. The second thing is the economy of energy. The economy of energy. What does that mean? That means, I'm going to be honest with you, the 30 or 40 people that do everything, they're going to get burned out. They're going to get burned out. They're going to get burned out in the nursery. They're going to get burned out in the children's ministry. They're going to get burned out doing everything. But when the, Bible, when the Bible tells us that every person does everything in order to bring glory to God, when the body of Christ works together as a unit, everything is important. We will not have burnout. We will not get discouraged. We will not get dissatisfied if we all do what God has called us to do. Don't allow people to get an overload. The long-term commitment that some people give turns into an overwhelming commitment, and instead of quitting the ministry, they quit the church. So what we have to do is we have to make sure that we have people that we are training. The Bible says our job is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. Our job is to get people into the ministry, get them involved, to train them and to equip them so there is no overload, there's no quit. Making the ministry fun. Because what we're doing is life-changing. Making ministry fun. How can you make ministry fun? Is understand the ultimate goal in what we're trying to accomplish. And what we're trying to accomplish is not to fill up a church. What we're trying to accomplish is to change people's lives. And when we can change people's lives and we can point people to Christ and the struggling becomes healed, the scars become healed, they give glory to God and things are taking place within their life, then it's all right to minister to that individual and then they become healed and then they go out and they start serving and they start ministering to other people. It is a gradual, slow process that when people come in, they see Christ because of us. They minister because you ministered to them. They reproduce themselves the way that you reproduce yourself in Christ. That is how the church grows. The economy of energy is not the short term. The economy of energy is long term. You do what God has called you to do and then back aside and let somebody else do something that they are called to do. And the entire church family ministers in a way that every joint supplieth the needs that brings the growth to the body. And then the accountability, the A is accountability. Holding people accountable is very important. And it's hard. Holding people accountable. You know, one of my weaknesses is, um, is, is follow through. I, I, I like having dreams. I like thinking about things. I like doing certain things. I like uh, thinking about how we can grow our church. But holding my, myself accountable is I have to, I have to relay my dreams. I have, to, I have to tell the deacons my dreams. I have to tell the staff what I want to do. It's because I hate failure. So if I don't communicate my dreams, then what it would be like, well, I'll, 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 do, I'll do that next year. So I like, I like sharing. I want to share what we can do, what we should do. And then people have to be around me that's going to say, hey, are we doing this? Or why are we doing this? Or, or can we do this? Because I need to be accountable to what I have. We must have Christian character. A man's word should be his bond. His dream that God has given to him should be the fire in his belly in order to accomplish what God has in store for him. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, it says, Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Here's the next word. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. The accountability is what we have to do is we have to walk up to people and we have to minister to them. And if we see somebody that's given their life to Christ, we're not, now, this is not being judgmental by any means. It's not looking at somebody and saying, you're not living up to a standard. It's not saying that you have a sin within your life, I have a sin within my life. It's not talking about that. It's talking about when I'm ministering to somebody, I need to be accountable that I'm going to follow through. I want to make sure that I do what Christ wants me to do. In order to do that, I have to be accountable. Out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and with careful instruction. Sometimes accountability is very difficult. And then M is management of mistakes. Management of mistakes. Um, John Maxwell says, the, the greater power that you have determines, what, no, to have great power in leadership, you must be able to admit your mistakes. And when you make a mistake, if you can admit it, 
the people that you are leading will follow you because they know that you're human. And I thought about that about every week that I preach. I thought, <laughs> they know that I'm human. They know that I make mistakes. They know that sometimes I don't know what I'm talking about. Management of mistakes means our brokenness is open. And when people can see, you know what? It's not about whether I'm perfect or not. It's whether I have a faith in God that can change my life, that I can bring glory to him. Mistakes are always there to grow us. If we can learn from our past, our future will be brighter. But if we are too ignorant to learn from our mistakes of our past, our future will be stagnant. We must move into the future with knowledge of where I've been. If we do not move into the future, if we're afraid to move into the future because of what I've done or where I've been, God is not supernaturally empowering your life. But when I can look back and I can see the mistakes personally or the church, when I look at those, I say, okay, what did we learn from this? What can we do from this to move into the future? I believe, you know, in, in our staff every, every Wednesday, the, there's a staff member that, that shows a video and then we discuss this video and it's, it's on right now ministries on our leadership team. And one of the videos that we just watched a couple weeks ago was talking about self-awareness, being self-aware, knowing the truth about yourself, knowing the truth about your church. We can't move into the future until we are truly aware of who we are right now. And once we're aware, once we know what our weaknesses are and even know what our strengths are, then we can move into the future. And as a church, I was thinking about that in this service. To have teamwork, what we have to do is we have to know our strengths. We have to know what our weaknesses are. And we have to work with our strengths and our weaknesses. We can't allow the weaknesses to hinder our future, nor can we only allow the strengths to empower. Or, you know, um, they, they would also say that for a volunteer, if a volunteer has 80% capacity of the person that's doing the job now, we should empower them to grow. If you had your job and you had some, a guy coming up and he was, you looked at him and he could do your job, our job as a minister, as a church, is to work ourselves out of a job, to train them up so they can take over and do something that you were doing or you can do. Even you enjoy doing it, but we can always bring somebody else up to minister to do something greater than ourselves. We have to be able to look and manage our mistakes and learn from our past. We have to be self-aware. And then the W stands for worship. The W stands for worship as a team. It is an awesome experience to worship God as a team. What does worship mean? You've heard many sermons on worship. Sometimes we think worship is with the band, which I, I think the band's doing a wonderful job. And I, I was encouraged this week during our deacon board meeting, um, just we're talking about worship and we were talking about our, our team. And, um, you know, there's not a person on this platform during the worship time that takes a penny from this church. They all worship God because they love Jesus. And some of the criticism that we get, you know, and I'm thinking, I don't see you up serving Jesus like they practice hours a week to love God, to worship God, to take the criticism. Sometimes they're out there on an island by themselves, out there singing and worshiping, and uh, I see their heart. And I think they're doing a wonderful job. I think we ought to give them a round just for what they do. It may, not be, it may not be what you like, but worship is not about you, and it's not about me. Worship is all about him. When we worship, he is the audience. He is the person we're singing to. And when we worship... We should close our hearts, or we should close our eyes and open our hearts and allow God to speak to us. When I was a youth pastor many, many years ago, we were at a youth camp, and I heard this illustration for the very first time. And it, 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 I didn't grow up in church. I really didn't understand the, the worship side of, of church and what it all meant. 
But the speaker came up right after get done, right after the worship got done, and he's getting ready to speak, and, and he said this. He goes, guys, let me tell you what worship is. He said, uh, I'm a farm boy. And he said, worship is an untilled ground, a pasture. And it hasn't been tilled for some time. And a farmer takes his tractor out, and he puts his till behind that tractor, and he just tills the ground and turns the ground over. It allows the air and allows it to break up. And then worship is after the music is done. Your heart is like that old ground that's just been tilled. It's been turned over. There's air gets to it and it's broken up. And then God speaks. The Holy Spirit has tilled your heart through music, through prayer, through teaching. And then the word of God can come in and can be planted in that tilled ground. Until you can worship God, until you can acknowledge God, until you can allow God to work within your life, the word of God will probably be of no effect if you're not allowing the Holy Spirit to turn your heart over and to allow it to be pliable and to be plantable. That's what worship is. When he said that, I thought, that is so true. That is so true. But sometimes... In church, worship gets to the point that we get mad. And how can we allow the Word of God be planted into our hearts if we have cut off the Holy Spirit because of our attitude of worship? So worship is a place where we can honor God. We don't have to enjoy everything about every song that everybody, I mean, look at all the, jo- uh, all the music styles. You're not going to like everything that has been played, but what we can do is we can honor God in what is played. So as a team, let us worship. Let's worship God knowing that God is the audience, and what we can do is we can trust in him. And when he does that, he can take care of every issue that we have. We fellowship as Christians, and what we have a common goal is in Christ, and we can worship in Christ. And then open communication. Open communication. In Proverbs 13, 17, it says, A wicked messenger falls into trouble, but a trustworthy envoy brings healing. A trustworthy envoy brings healing. Open communication. I, uh, I also had a deacon this way. You know, deacon meetings, they, they could be tough. I had a deacon, and I'm not going to mention his name, but he said this. He goes, Whose stupid idea was that to have those comment cards given out to the church? And I said, What do you mean? He goes, he goes, you should have heard some of those comment cards. And I thought, you know what? Open communication is a very good thing. Now, hateful communication is not a good thing. Remember the scripture says, speaking the truth in what? Love. If, if you're the goose and you're in the back and you're not encouraging, what are you doing? You're just honking. You're just blah, 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 blah. And everybody, everybody has the right to talk but I love this phrase, but you have to earn the right to be heard. You can talk all you want, but when you talk, the way you're going to be heard is if you earn the right because you love and you encourage and you think for the right path. Open communication is you can share about anything. We could talk about every topic of every ministry, of everything's going on. Speaking the truth in love brings growth to the body. We must be able to communicate open communication in order to accomplish great things. And then, recognize and reward. R. Recognize and reward. I think this is one of the most important things that you could do. Recognize and reward. When somebody serves, when somebody does something, thank you. Just a, just a pat on the back. Just an encouragement. Just saying thanks for what you do. Our church would not be anything that it is if it wasn't for the volunteers that serve Jesus. And we have to say thank you. Now, the ultimate reward is going to come from Christ. But reward, recognition, thanking them for what they've done. When we, when we receive recognition and a reward, when we receive honor, we must just be a reflective nature back up to Christ. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And, and don't take it personal because I love this phrase. I'm not half as bad as what you think I am, and I'm not near as good as what some people think I am. I'm just right down the middle. So when somebody hates me, or when somebody thinks I'm awesome, you know what? 
Let's just separate the two. Let's just be happy who God created us to be. And in the church, we're not wonderful. We have all kinds of issues, but we are a hospital full of crazy individuals that just love Jesus, that want to bring people to the saving knowledge of Christ. And if we get to that point, our recognition is when Christ says, I want to bring somebody else into the church. I want to bring somebody else that is hurting. I want to bring somebody that is just wanting to quit. And the Holy Spirit prompts you to come alongside them. That is the recognition of God, that he has found us faithful in order to bring somebody in that the church can do something great for them. There's not a greater recognition in the world than God finding us faithful. The only way that we're going to be faithful is if we fulfill God's plan. And fulfilling God's plan is ministering. Remember, everything that you've gone through, it may have been painful. You may have hated the moment that you've gone through it. It may have been devastating to you during that time. But in the end, when we trust in Christ and we allow Christ to heal us, that pain that you've gone through is going to be for his glory. And remember, everything that we go through, he is going to walk with it. He's going to walk us through it. And when we are healed from it, don't, don't think for a second that there's people in this church that is going through or has gone through or will be going through the same stuff that you've gone through. And the pain that you have felt at that moment, the hate that you felt for an individual, the things that you've gone through that you absolutely despise, but God has healed and God has worked through that pain. Those issues are going on in other people's lives. And if you can take your pain and to ease somebody else's pain because God has called you to be that minister to their life, that is recognition that God found you faithful. You know, when we stand before Christ and he gives us this last phrase, well done, thy good and faithful servant. You're not faithful to coming to church. You're not faithful because you drove 10 miles in the snow on a Sunday morning. That's not faithfulness. What faithfulness is, is when the Holy Spirit of God prompts you and you don't want to, you don't want to share your life or you don't want to take your mask off, but yet God tells you to. And you look at him and say, okay. And you do it. Well done. Good and faithful servant. That is where I believe God tells us as a church whether we are going to grow as a team or not, whether we can be faithful or not. When we are faithful, God can do great things. And then we need to keep on learning. We need to keep on learning. The moment we stop learning, changing, or growing, we start to die. And in a church, we must keep on learning. We must keep on learning what we can do, what we should do. The worst thing that a church can do and a team can do is stick their head in the sand and think that they've arrived. The worst thing you can do in your life is to think that you've arrived. We always have to continue to learn, to grow, and to thrive. And when we are growing, God does the blessing. In Proverbs 18, 15, the heart of a discerning acquires knowledge. The ears of the wise seek it out. Ears of the wise seek it out. We need to learn. If you're struggling in your life, if the church is struggling in its life, what do we do? Do we hope it goes away? You know what? Anytime that we play the ostrich and stick our head in the sand and hope it goes away, it doesn't go away, does it? Usually it just gets worse. What we must do is we have to learn. We have to learn from our past to move into the future. We have to grow. And the only way that we're going to grow is to follow God's leadership. And following God's leadership, I want to read this scripture. You know it. We have already read it. But speaking the truth in love, church, we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, and that's Jesus Christ. And listen to what his, what his words to us are. 
from whom the whole body, not just the 30, not just the 50, the 600, when the 600 people of Glenville joined and knit together by every joint that supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. When we are part of a team, the church, we can come in and we can enjoy. But for the edifying of itself means I want you to be happy. I want you to grow. Not only in knowledge, but I believe what Paul is talking about is in spirit. To grow spiritually. To grow as a mature believer. To be able to go through stuff and understand that God's going to bless me. God's going to work through me. God's going to teach me. And I'm not going to sit there and be complacent about my life. I'm going to learn what does the word of God say? What can I teach? What can I learn? How can I grow? And if we as a body, we as a team, can look at this and say, I need to become mature. I need to grow. And I need to learn. We can have a great team. But here's the deal with the church. We've all been to all kinds of different churches. Good churches and bad churches. And there's, a, there's better churches and there's worse churches. Every church is unique. Every church is different. But every church is inspired by God to fulfill his calling. And when God brought you to this church, to Glenville, he didn't bring you into a facility and say, there you go, enjoy. He brought you here for a purpose. And that purpose is to grow the church. Not numerically, but spiritually. When every person that comes into the church says, what can I do? Not what I can get. What can I do to minister to others? When we get to the point that every member or every, every person that calls Glenville their home sets and looks at a way that they can give back to God. See, you don't serve me and you don't serve the church. Do you know who you're serving? Jesus. It's found here. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head and that is Christ. When we serve Christ, we are serving the people. And when somebody is struggling, when somebody is hurting, when somebody has questions, and they set in our church, and they're sitting in a corner, sitting in the center of a bunch of people, but yet they're so alone, they're so struggling, they're tore up on the inside, yet they can raise their hands and worship. They can look intently. But if you would take that mask off, they'd be a little child saying, I need help. Here's the difference. The Holy Spirit is the discerner of our hearts. And he said that he can take a struggling person and he can take them and he can love them and he can help them. But here's how he does it. He takes his people, his church, and he says, I want to give to you the greatest ability, the discerning spirit, and I want to give to you the ability to look into somebody's life and to come into their life and to help them. That's the job of the church. It's not how many we run. It's not how big our building is. It's are we changing people's lives. And if we do that right, if we get to the point that we have the entire church family ministering, we then will be successful. Kind of like this little Fitbit. I can push this button, and I can see how many miles I've walked, and I can see how many calories I've burned, and I can see how much activity I've had. It's just a little Fitbit. It could be worthless or it could be very worthy or worthwhile. It's what do I do with this information? 
Is it a motivator? Or is it something that I can just keep in my pocket and not even worry about? I believe when God called you here and he put you in this place, he put you here for a purpose. And that purpose is to change people's lives. As we said in the introductions, there's all kinds of different people here. I can look across this audience in every section and look at individuals and because I'm your pastor, I know all kinds of junk about everybody in this auditorium. I can look at you and I can tell story after story after story after story after story. And so you don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. I understand, I won't, I won't. You know the reality? Is we all are needy. We're a church full of hurting people. And we need each other. You know, Greg Marshall, a coach at Wichita State, he said this a couple years ago. He said, it's easy to recruit great players. It's hard to get great players to play as a team. We can be full of ourselves. We can be great as individuals. But we can do great things when we do it as a team. We can do awesome as a team. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you. And Lord, we thank you for what you've done for us, and I ask you to bless us. I pray that we as a church will honor you in everything. We'll speak the truth in love. We'll honor you as the head of the church. We will worship your name, and we'll honor you with our hearts, and we'll allow the old hard soil of our heart to be turned over so the word of God can be planted within our life. And it can change us. And the junk that we've gone through in our past will be there to motivate us into the future. And Lord, I pray that you will give to us grace and love and mercy because you've already given to us the forgiveness that we so richly need. So Lord, bless us today as a church and as a team that we will honor you we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pastor Mark.